Welcome to Dungeon Brew. Today, Josh and I are going to be continuing our series on narrative design. Today, we're going to be discussing environment in writing and TTRPGs. Stay tuned. All right, welcome back. Today, we'll be talking about environment, one of my favorite aspects of world building because not because it makes things so real, really, when you're diving into things. But that's just among other things. We'll, we'll get into it. Uh, Josh, why don't you start? What What is environment? Yeah, so when I think about the environment, I'm typically thinking about the setting. It's the place. It's the location that you're telling your story in. It can be the world itself. It can scan over you know, multiple continents or just one centralized locale. And today, we're going to be talking about not only the content design or in terms of narration of that environment, but also the system design in terms of how that environment should be responding to the choices that your characters make. So kind of hitting this twofold, even though we're placing this underneath the system design section. Yeah, and this is this is huge. This is one of, I think, the biggest, most important aspects of creation when it comes to world building, whether in games or writing or, um, you know, anything where you're creating a storyline um, attached. Uh, what would you say are some of the key features to environment when you're when you're first starting out? So we're going to be doing another video on world building in general and all the different things that go into that. But in terms of the environment, you're looking at things like the geography, the landscape, uh, maybe plant life, animal life the the weather that that's taking place within the area that the characters are in the, these are the things you're primarily focusing on those things that you can like i don't know the, the scenery like like the ambiance that you're bringing them into that again like you said it brings the world alive it makes them feel as though they are really there yeah and it should be affecting everything too i mean it should be affecting your characters their um you know not just you know their i i guess their the realism around them but kind of moving them or helping move things along when it comes to uh, what they're going to be facing on quests and things like that yeah from the get-go you would think of when you're like stepping into your story in a game that looking at the landscape is going to give you a sense of what it is you're going to be facing there's such a different feel that if i start off a game and i have like this this uh panoramic kind of playing across where I see, you know, mountains and volcanoes in the backdrop versus, you know, a seaside town where, you know, there's people singing shanties on the docks. Or if I'm coming into a place where, you know, it's just desolate land and wild lightning striking down or, or a desert landscape, like it immediately tells me this is like what I'm going to be facing and what's going to be going on. And we see this pretty frequently in video games. You know, they always start off with their a uh, little, uh, again, panoramic that kind of plays across the scene as you see all these animals and creatures and and people kind of engaging in their regular lives um, before a catastrophe hits. And so that's mm -hmm. what you want to be kind of capturing in that initial part when you're bringing the characters into the world. Yeah, it, it helps kind of get the player um, or reader in that mindset of um, kind of feeling comfortable in whatever place they're in or, or if they're supposed to feel uncomfortable you can mm -hmm. create that emotion by creating the environment as well if your character happens to um be starting out uh you know like on conan exiles you start out as you know a person that's been like you know hung up on a cross in the mm -hmm. middle of the desert mm -hmm. um you're not starting out comfortably but that's kind of the theme of the whole game and it keeps you know keeps you going with that theme of um you know that discomfort that need for survival you're you know experiencing heat stroke and you know probably starving to death um but it immediately puts you in the mood or the theme of that story as you go yeah and there should be a sense of almost intensity in that moment when you're mm -hmm. coming into it just in terms of like how am i going to be affected by what's around me you know if i'm going to be traveling through the nine hells and that's the environment i'm setting into i know that fireballs falling from the sky and lightning striking down and uh, being thirsty and having scarce resources so I can't find food are all going to be elements of this game that I'm stepping into that I have to be considerate of. I'm immediately aware of that theme. And you, and you mentioned it, like that tone and that mood should immediately be like at the onset when that inner environment's being introduced to you. And this also has a lot to do with like season. I don't know if we mentioned that, but season is a big portion of this too in determining what type of season you're stepping into in terms of what to expect. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, 
So I'm, I'm trying to think of how you want me to approach it. I immediately think of, you know, how the season is going to um, kind of force the story to go as well and force, you know, the the players to mm-hmm. go. Because once you start recognizing something's changing in the season, um, then, you know, there's kind of like that next, you know, that kind of push like, okay, mm-hmm. well, something should have happened by now. Um, I'm not entirely sure what way you want me to. Well, I mean, just from. like the four seasons in general, in terms of like the ambiance that you feel like if I'm starting off in spring, there's like this feeling of hope and birth and growth when I'm coming oh. in and things are blooming, as opposed to if I'm starting a story in the midst of winter, where people are hunkered down in their cottages over fire, you know, cooking a, a stew or, you know, maybe just lentil soup because they can't find meat is a completely different feel when I step into that type of scene. Yeah, you can't grow stuff in winter, so you can't exactly be surviving very well besides what you have. So you got to kind of keep that um, keep that at the surface of uh, of your mind as you're creating, as you're moving forward. I'm actually dealing with that in um, my third book because they're coming into winter and they're traveling mm-hmm. over um, this like it's almost like a tundra kind of um, environment, um, you know, in the midst of a blizzard. So not mm-hmm. only is it winter, but it's the extreme level of that season as well which i think you can play with um i mean you can even kind of throw in little things that are uh fun just for the sake of you know depth um having a character you know who's allergic you know to who has allergies or something you know and it's spring so you have the extreme Mm -hmm. kind of response to the season as well that i think is kind of uh something that often gets overlooked people don't you know sit there and think about oh well how you know oh it's spring oh well look how pretty it is look how wonderful it is Mm -hmm. oh well what if somebody gets stung by a bee you know (laughs) what if somebody is severely allergic to pollen or something but um i i think there's little things like that that the more people kind of or creators consider um you know putting into their world building the more you're really going to bring it to life and keep your players excited i was like i think there was a story of a king of wales or essex that was actually stung by a bee and died <laughs> and so the king oh. died and that was like the course of it but, but you're right um in, in terms of like how your seasons are coming into play what the environment looks like these should provide obstacles for your characters they should create tension mm-hmm. for it um, you know, if you're within the shadow of a mountain or the banks of a river or you're in a thriving seaside town, um, whatever the, the struggles are, you know, if you're on the tundra or you can't find food, all of these should give some indication or some hint to what your goals are going to be, what your quests are going to be, the type of engagement that you're going to start having with that world. It, it, it should really play into or at least parallel with the story that you're telling. Yeah, I mean, if you're traveling through, you know, a mountainous region and it's winter, you're going to be slipping on Mm -hmm. rocks. You can break a leg by falling too hard. Or if you're sneaking through a, you know, farmer's fields or something, ah, you're caught in a bear trap. Like, (laughs) what kinds of other things are um, going to provide those obstacles is, I think, really, really important to keep in mind. Because that's, um, once again, going to not only, like, create... um, potential side quests too, Mm -hmm. when there's, you know, say, okay, you have a river in front of you um, and you have to get across that river, but it's too deep. It's Mm -hmm. too fast. Okay. Now side quest, everybody has to go gather this stuff to start building a bridge or something. Mm -hmm. Um, But it just adds, you know, it adds more to the story Mm -hmm. and keeps it going. I love that. It's not, we're going to find a way to like get across this river and, you know, get the wagon put up and just Oregon trail, the son of a bitch. It's we're going to build a fucking bridge. (laughs) Like that's the next level that we're going to do is we're building a bridge across the river. But well, I'm thinking like, okay, we, we had a D and D game some years ago where we had to cross, um, some like river of lava or something. And Mm. we had just fought, I don't remember what we were fighting, but we used their bodies <laughs> as, <laughs> as a bridge across. So that's immediately what comes to mind for me. So I'm like, all right, so if you're in the woods or, you know, you have a river in front of you, you're going to go gather the things that you could find. That's That was my comparison. That's where that came from. <laughs> I love it. No, you can get very creative scenery or scenes going on in D&D as you're trying to overcome those obstacles. But yeah, you need to know what types of natural threats the environment is going to provide for you. So, you know, the the, the rushing river, if it's a, um, a volcano that's erupted and you have lava spilling down from the mountain, if, you have, if you're on the prairie and you have tornadoes and uh, huge thunderstorms that are coming across and having to weather that storm. And then, like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, whatever your threats to or that are coming from you know natural plant life or growth, are there vines, are there uh, plant creatures, are there 
can, can poisonous never, mushrooms. Yeah, poisonous mushrooms. Can, carnivorous. Uh, am I saying that? Carnivorous. 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 carnivorous? You say it. You're Romanian. Uh, carnivorous. Yeah, uh, animals that that you have to be worried about that are roaming about. Uh, all those things you have to consider in developing that environment, and they should add to the story that you're already telling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because. I mean, it's, the stories are all about, you know, you being involved, you feeling like you're there. It's it's that escapism. You can't, mm-hmm. if you don't have all that, then it just, it gets boring. And if you get boring, then your gamers aren't going to want to play anymore. So if you, got, if you guys are enjoying this lively conversation, make sure you're hitting the subscribe button, hitting the bell, um, as we continue on to talk a little bit about the design pieces that go into the environment. All right, so the next thing that we probably need to look at is the system piece itself and talking about how when you're developing your environment, when you're creating that narrative piece around it, recognizing how it shouldn't remain stagnant. How should this Mm -hmm. change or contrast over time, especially related to your central conflict that you have going on? If you're telling a story that's taking place in the midst of World War One and maybe the the eclipse of the Industrial Revolution, and you have these war factories that are creating things and smog filling the air. How is that changing the landscape of cities? How is that impacting the health of the people within those cities? If you're in a medieval time frame and you're fighting a dragon that's you know raising the land with fire and burning crops and and um, farmhouses and that type of thing, how is that impacting the environment? And how is that again changing? the the interaction that your character should be having in that place that should also be changing kind of like the culture of a place the culture of a town um like you know like you were saying if there's you know with all, all that smog you know or there's some sort of factory explosion or something mm-hmm. all those people over time their mentality their approach to survival is going to change so the way that they interact with mm-hmm. um the player is going to change you know they're going to be a little more on edge or a little more um, untrustworthy, you know, especially if things are, you know, suddenly dark everywhere because that smog is really lowered, you know, onto the town, you know, there's more crime going on as people are sneaking around getting away with things. And it, it's uh, not only, you know, do you increase the emotional response, mm-hmm. um, whether through fear or through whatever it is, you know, that uh, makes sense with your environment, um, but making, you know, making sure that even the dialogue um, is going to be changing. You're not going to have that same uh, behaviors mm-hmm. or interactions with people than you would have before the terrible thing happened. Yeah, and you're talking a lot about the social environment there and how those things are going to change and be shifted a little bit, which we're going to cover a lot when we get into the world building video overall. But you're right, all those environmental pieces in terms of what is in, happening in the environment with the characters and the, the people um, should be a direct result of how the environment is changing around them. John and I did a video recently where we were talking about how a lot of people become comfortable within their environment and the way that they're living and it becomes this mm-hmm. uh, stimulus response scenario that's occurring that when that is disrupted, chaos ensues, anarchy ensues, and people mm-hmm. start to freak out because they don't know how to interact with this new environment they have found themselves in that has been completely changed by a course of events within the story. Yeah. And I mean, when you're talking about more environment stuff, too, obviously, there's going to be effects of, you know, what that smog is going to do to the plant life, Mm -hmm. what kind of how it's going to affect their crops. You know, are they even able to eat anything now or are people getting sick now from uh, some sort of, you know, natural sort of chemical reaction that's happened to their Mm -hmm. plants or something? Um, But uh, I I tend to lean to that social um, I, I guess the social environment immediately because I still think that emotion has so much to do with um, keeping the reader, uh, you know, immersed in the mm-hmm. story. Um, and I think, you know, you, you can use all of that to just bring out that emotion more. And a way to keep your characters really immersed in what's going on is making sure that the decisions that they're making are having a direct result on the environment around them, too. Uh, we did a campaign once where we were. Um, essentially on the onset of an industrial revolution that was impacting the fey kind in the nearby forest. And we were able to make decisions on whether or not we were going to help the fey in maintaining the, the nature aspect of it, or we were going to help the cities in helping expand their businesses and their industry um, 
to be able to help the people that were within the town that needed that industry in order to survive. So it was like, do we kill the, the fae or do we kill the people? Uh, which was kind of the back and forth that we had in there, which we'll be talking about uh, morality and motivations in our next video. But the choices that we made had an immediate impact on the environment that we were finding ourselves in. And no matter what decision we made, would have a response from one of those two cultures uh, because of how the environment was going to impact them. If we were helping the Fae, then the, the cities were going to suffer. And if we were going to help the cities, the Fae were going to suffer. I love that. I literally, like, recent, I, I did something similar in one of my books where it was actually around the pixies, mm -hmm. um, which are these, you know, little uh, bastards that get this, like, bloodlust um, when they're, like, or blood fever when they're, like, in a group, and they're kind of like sharks, and they just tear things up, um, tear things up. But the main character was kind of, ha uh, was kind of faced with, okay, do we divert this swarm, you know, in the way that we know how, um, you know, in this place where it's just going to kill them off because it's the easiest, the quickest and just kill them off and let mm -hmm. them let that be that. Or do we find a way to divert them back where their home, you know, their, where they belong? Um, but, you know, but then that's just going to create more you know issues with the big, the big bad guy. But no, I love I love that because it makes the character, it makes the players actually start questioning themselves. And once again, we'll get into the morality thing in the, in the next video. But I think um, that's important is to make the characters kind of really apply themselves mm -hmm. to what's going on as well. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm trying to think of things to sum up with this for you guys to like really pull this together when you're thinking about it. For me, it's, it's again, you want to have an initial idea of your environment and your content design when you're creating it. Know where you're coming from, know what the landscape looks like, know what the geography looks like, know what the weather is going to be, know how that's going to reinforce or support your story elements. But then as your characters start to make decisions, make sure that you're impacting that that environment to respond to that decision making that they have. And that's the system design piece. It's having the system then be responsive to the decisions that characters are making. Yeah, and leave room for change too, because it adds a little more fun, a little more depth. You know, if you're crossing, you know, one kind of terrain to the next, or if the season's starting to slowly mm -hmm. change, you know, start uh, pointing out little things like the turning of the leaves or something, you know, just to kind of create more of that immersion. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you guys so much for hanging out. We'll talk to you next time.